Well, we're here today in Montague and interviewing John Luttrell. And um, my name is Tanya Kabbalah. I will be doing the interviewing, and Oscar Oswo will be doing the videographing. And um, first, John, want to check to see if you read and signed the legal release. I did. Thank you very much. And I would like you to start by tell us, telling us a little bit about why you're here in the White Lake area and your family history. How, how'd you get here? I am so blessed. Um, my grandpa, Krupp, my mom's mom and dad bought this property the year my mom and dad were getting married. He had no grandchildren yet, but he wanted this nine acres on White Lake. He had fished up here with his friend, Mr. Johnson, at one time. but. Uh, and through the Johnsons, he heard that this property was available. And uh, so he bought this nine acres on the lake, thinking that someday this is where he was going to entertain his children and his grandchildren. And that's exactly what happened. He bought the property in 1948. And I was born eight years later. So there's a little history here before my time. But uh, um, uh, he, he always said, don't cut down any, any uh, pine trees. He loved everything evergreen. The, the two original cottages on the property were built with pine that was cut off the property. And uh, so it's real rustic and um, it, was, it was just a fantasy land for, for our family who grew up in the Heights on a 50-foot lot, <laughs> very small but very nice, and uh, close to our grandparents. But in the summer we were here 10 weeks um, from the, when school got out until the last, till the middle of August every year with Grandma and Grandpa, and we would, we would uh, play cards with Grandma and Grandpa. We'd bake with Grandma. We we'd fish. We'd hunt for mushrooms with Grandpa, and it's it is it's just been a fantasy land for all of us. And Grandpa wanted it kept in the family, and after him, my mom also wanted it left in the family. So it's uh, it's and we hope we can keep it forever and hopefully my nieces and nephews will value it the way that my mom's children have so so you live here now i live here now i'm and, uh, and have lived here for quite some time i've lived here full time since 1981 we always summered here our our whole lives and i was gone for just seven years when i graduated from high school in 1974 i moved to arizona and lived there for my college years for five years I lived in Chicago for two years, so I experienced the big city, and and I'd come up here almost every weekend in the summer, and I, th I thought, well, this is crazy. Lots of, eight hours out of my weekend, I was spent on the road to and from Chicago. I said, time to go back to Michigan, so. And a lot of my family was here. Only one brother stayed in Chicago. The rest of us are all in the White Lake area, and we love the cottage, but we love Montague and the Whitehall area. Do you, can you describe some of your earliest memories of White Lake? I, well, like I said, when you're a kid, everything just seems so perfect. But um, we had, our friends were people that were here. There's a few people that were here before us. I think we're one of the oldest families in the neighborhood now. But uh, we knew the McFalls that owned what is now Blueberry Ridge. And they were friends from Sparta. And uh, I was one of the younger kids, um, the McFalls and my older brothers and sisters and the, the Johnsons and the Camp Smiths were all about five years older than I am. So I was just one of the tag along kids, but uh, we, uh, we all skied together and uh, played softball together and fished together. And uh, it was, and actually my sister, we summered here from Muskegon, but my brother-in-law uh, Paul Rolovitz summered up here from Chicago, and that, that is how they met. So it's kind of neat that the White Lake area has brought families together that way, relationships together. So you were on the lake quite a bit. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Swimming and fishing and skiing and just enjoying the beach. We, we, we always just had a, a lot of fun just uh, socializing down at the lake. It's, oh. And uh, my grandma, what grandma and I would go down to the boathouse even sometimes. If grandpa was looking over our shoulder, she said, let's go play cards down in the boathouse. So really good memories. They, they were in their 60s before I was ever born, but they 
luckily grandpa lived to be in his later 70s and grandma was 88 when she died so she was a big part of our life so. when did you become aware of, of pollution issues related to white lake i was pretty young when we we always knew hooker we didn't know the extent of the problems that they were creating but they had emissions that we could smell. Our driveway's a half mile long, so there's certain things that didn't come in this far. But uh, we could smell, it was kind of a sweet smell. And when we smelled the emissions, um, my mom would call, and Mrs. Johnson, I remember, were the, the ladies in the neighborhood that, that mostly would call to alert them that, you know, maybe they had a problem, so. They called Hooker Chemical? They, yeah. I think there was a Mr. Colpoise that they talked to. I can't think of his first name, but uh, that was his name. Mr. Colpoise was kind of their PR man, so. Oh, Dwayne Colpoise. Okay, all right. The plant manager. Right. Uh, were you aware of any other um, effects from the pollution? I know we heard people talk about um, trees that were damaged by uh, pollution discharges. I was pretty young when that when that happened but I do remember it we had uh, taking a taking a trip as a family to the UP my dad always wanted to go up north if we went anywhere if we weren't at the cottage we'd take a little trip once in a great while normally we're just happy to be here but um, yeah we came home and everything was brown from Old Channel Trail like halfway to the lake up our property everything had been um, it wasn't, I'm not sure that it was all defoliated, but everything turned brown. The, the pine needles turned brown, and a lot of our pine trees never came back. And there was a settlement, they gave us, it, I don't, it was probably a lot of money back then, a couple thousand dollars. I remember my mom um, buying us a chainsaw with the settlement money, and we had to keep track of our hours. My older brothers could, were old enough to run a chainsaw, so for several winters all five of us kids were cutting and burning treetops and uh, just cleaning up the mess that was left most of the hardwood trees all came back but i think it damaged the trees you know you you can't defoliate a tree in the middle of the summer and not have it cause some damage permanent damage so so you you received a settlement and other neighbors too yes yeah um and it was like from here west to, I think it kind of petered out once it got to the Timbers property. I don't think they lost too much. So there's a, a neighbor over there that could probably, she was, a, she was uh, about my mom's age, a little younger, uh, Evelyn uh, Ekstrand is her name, or Lo Lois Ekstrand. And uh, she's, a, she's a summer person from Chicago, so she'd have you know good recollection of that too. Did you remember any other um, uh, visible effects on the lake itself, or any changes in the lake? We we did see uh, they had a discharge um, pipe that went through their property, and it would bubble up through what we all call the turtle pond, but it was an old mill pond on Dowie Point, and. As far as I know, that that pipe is probably still on the bottom of the lake. I don't think they've they've ever dug up all their uh, pipes, but they would discharge, and you could see it on the surface of the lake going so up the lake. That was Hooker Chemical. That was Hooker Chemical. I didn't really uh, have much recollection of what Dupont was doing. We did go out to Lake Michigan to see their discharge site at, uh, a couple times, and that would bubble up in Lake Michigan. And, but I think all DuPont did on White Lake was um, they had a water intake on Long Point. We all knew where that was because when it's real quiet, you could hear it humming. I think they may have used it for non-contact cooling water. Right, possibly. yeah, they, they, but they, they got their water out of, out of White Lake. And I guess Hooker did too. They had some kind of a pumping station down at the lake also. Were your, um, were your parents concerned about um, you know the kids swimming in White Lake at all? Your, your family? I don't. I don't think so. I. I don't think people were really aware until later, um, when the term C56 came up. There was a cancer-causing agent that was 
revealed later, and I think it's about the time we were moving to Arizona. Of course, we are going to keep the property in our family, but uh, yeah, C the C-56 was a concern. But we never stopped eating the fish. And of course, I've been kidded about being stunted. <laughs> I'm kind of short, but our family was short before <laughs> we ever came to White Lake. So. so for the most part, your family wasn't concerned about the health effects or potential health effects. Well, we were concerned when the gas defoliated the trees and like what else is, you know, what else is going to happen and what is in this uh, gas that we can smell, this discharge, you know, this sweet, kind of sweet smelling, whatever. But uh, luckily we're, we're on the other end of the wind. The wind usually comes from the southwest, so a lot of times it was, I was more concerned about the people that lived in town, like around Anderson Road, because that they were right in, in line for where the wind was going on a regular basis. So. Did your family ever contact Hooker Chemical about any concerns? Well, just like, just that they called Mr. Colpoys. So I think Mrs. Johnson, because she lived here year round, we were just summer residents. And like a, uh, I think she was, she was kind of a, a worrying lady anyway. So, but uh, me, you know, rightfully so, you know. Um, again, the Johnsons, all of our neighbors were here before Hooker came. Um, the stacks between us and Blueberry Ridge came, I think they bought the property during the war and they didn't come up until, but before my grandpa bought his property, Mr. McFall was here before Hooker came. So they were kind of stuck with the fact that this big chemical company was, was being established across the road. But, and I, I don't know, Lee can maybe verify this, Mr. McFall, Lee McFall. From what I heard, my grandpa, because he was a businessman, and you know, you gotta be a little assertive when you're a businessman, and Mr. McFall was a businessman. What I heard, of course I was very young, was that they fought to keep the Hooker Chemical um, complex off the lake. I had heard that they were gonna build it on the bluff overlooking the lake, which would have been disastrous in hindsight because now there's this big buffer area where there are purge wells purging polluted groundwater and they wouldn't have that luxury if the pollution was already right on the shores of White Lake. So what is very bad and has been bad could have been worse possibly. So, Were you aware of any of the local protests or, or when, when people started raising concerns publicly? Well, like I said, I was away for seven years, and I think that's about the time the concerns were being raised. And I graduated from high school in 74. That's the year we moved to Arizona. And we'd pop in and out. Um, my dad couldn't handle uh, the humidity in Michigan anymore, so we weren't here very long, and I was lifeguarding in Arizona. But um, it was after that that uh, I think pollution problems were brought to light. And then we heard they were going to drag everything, all the polluted soils back from Swartz Creek. And I don't know what years that happened, but we were very concerned about that. So. Well, the cleanup, the initial cleanup of the site was 1981-1982. And that's the year I moved back here. Oh, so, okay. Yeah. And then I there was um, a problem local folks were not happy with the fact that waste from Berlin and Farrell, mm -hmm. Swartz Creek, was also trucked into the, the vault. And of course, we've always been given assurances that everything's done well and everything's safe. Well, what is safe and for how long? And when I think when it came to light that there was a no, man, no man's land on their property right behind their buildings where they had dumped contaminated waste and I don't know if it was 55 gallon drums or whatever but it was like a no man's land meaning it was this is it was contained by the company but we knew it was very very dangerous and we were all very disappointed very angry when we found out that after the contaminated soils from Swartz Creek filled the vault they actually didn't have room for the contaminated soils that were left here in Montague. When they closed the vault, no man's land was was not completely remediated from what I remember. So well, they 
they did, um, that there were a number of areas left uh, that were eventually cleaned up in the mid-1990s. It is all cleaned up now. Mid-1990s, the Environmental Protection Agency uh, ordered Hooker Chemical to come in, do an additional investigation of the site, and clean up those areas that you're talking about. And were those added to the vault? Yes, or not necessarily to the vault, because that was already closed and oh, sealed. Okay, so I don't know what they did with that waste. So I don't know, it's, it's just hard sometimes to trust the government. Again, I grew up in the Heights, and we had a DNR back then, and we lived very close to Little Black Creek, which flows into Mona Lake, and my brother was a trapper, like my dad had been a trapper, and couldn't get a good pelt off of a muskrat in Little Black Creek, and it was later disclosed that Peerless Plating, among other companies along Little Black Creek, were using it as a, as a for discharge directly into the creek. So we had a DNR, functioning DNR. So I just don't really trust those, those, those groups that are supposed to give us that warm, fuzzy feeling that there's oversight of, you know, potential polluters, tanneries and chemical companies. And White Lake has just had more than its share of polluters, so. What about, um, there were some local protests during the cleanup due to the fact that other wastes were uh, being trucked onto the Correct. property. Did you participate in those? I can't remember that I did. I was cheering them on, but I don't think for time reasons or whatever, I, I knew what um, Ken and Mary Mahoney were doing, and they were standing in front of trucks and trying to make a statement, but uh, I was never there myself. So. Do you remember the controversy in the community? Do you remember some of the concerns that were raised? And well, at that point, I think the company was closed, so I think everybody's concern was not that we were going to be losing jobs. I'm sure at one point there were people that were in support of Hooker because they had brought tax base to the area. I had heard that they were instrumental in giving Montague a nicer high school than they normally would have had because of the tax base that they provided to the area. There were people working here and raising families with, you know, salaries that they earned at Hooker Chemical. But after they were gone, I think the, the only concern was that it was cleaned up properly. And I think we're kind of relatively happy with the fact that uh, there is a purging system now. There is a test well on our property halfway between here and Old Channel Trail. I don't know if you saw it coming in. It's off to the west, about halfway out. And it's tested by the EPA. So, And it's monitored by, what is his name, uh, Mr. Bell over at the Hooker facility now. So It's always tested clean? Yes, yeah. So. I mean, we want, to, we want to believe that they're giving us, uh, I, I, we're not scientists, so <laughs> they, they, reassure, they assure us that everything is, is fine. So we, we are still on our own well water here. We're at Blueberry Ridge, I think it was the early 70s, sometime in the 70s, they were sucking contaminated water into their homes. And apparently there was a smell and a taste, which is horrible. I just can't imagine that those... Poor people had to endure that, but apparently there was a lawsuit, and I know that those folks and whoever buys their their homes from now until forever get free city water that Occidental Petroleum pays for. We're not, we don't have that luxury. We we were not part of that lawsuit, so if for some reason our well ever tested um, for and was polluted. We would have to pay double the city. We, we can tie into that same water line that Blueberry Ridge has come to their homes, but we would pay double the city rate if we, uh, unless again we open some kind of a lawsuit. But we're hoping that the reverse of the groundwater, them pulling it away from the lake, is going to assure, assure us that our water is safe. Do you, did you know any of the workers, the Hooker Chemical Company workers, and did you ever have any conversations with them about the pollution issues? I didn't know any of them until after it was closed, but um, I don't know if you know Tim Bays from town. 
I think he worked in purchasing, and he, uh, he said it's the best job he ever had. <laughs> and of course, he was very young when he went there, and I'm sure they were paying well. So a lot of people in the White Lake area probably, I'm sure people at the tannery weren't making the money that they were making at Hooker or DuPont. So yeah, I've, uh, I think the Anderson, Mr. Uh, Mr. Anderson, he raised four boys. Uh, not sure what his first name was. He's gone now, but his boys all live in the area still. But indirectly, I know a lot of families. So, so you there. really didn't talk about pollution issues with them? No, no. It was I was I was pretty young, so it was kind of like listening to my mom and Mrs. Johnson kind of <laughs> take care taking care of business. So when you found out uh, the extent of pollution in the White Lake area, not just Tucker Chemical, but mm -hmm. other sites, um, was were you surprised? I was very disappointed. It's such a beautiful area. I don't think there's a more beautiful area. I mean, there's, Michigan is a beautiful state, but it is so beautiful here. And uh, it wasn't just one. There's at least four major polluters in the area, and I just thought that was really very, very sad. So I'm, I'm glad we're on top of it now, but uh, it, it is sad because I think... As time goes on, the whole country is just more aware of how precious water is. And it's like we had too much water, and we were just very reckless with water. In this, in this area, in this community, in this county, Muskegon County has a very bad track record. Mona Lake, again, a lot of the creeks are polluted. Very few of them are not polluted. And uh, again, I think they're cleaning them up, but... Once something's been polluted, when do you really feel safe that it's, you know, safe for children to play in and where are the sediments, you know? But, so I think there's still areas that we have to be very concerned about. How do you feel um, the, the whole issue of pollution affected the White Lake area? Well, for a while it was real adverse. I mean, when they tell you don't eat the fish, that's, that's, that's a problem. But I think because of its beauty, uh, we've always drawn a lot of people from Grand Rapids and Chicago in particular, and uh, some of these homes have been, summer homes have been in people's families for almost 100 years. Ours is just in the family a mere 65 years, so, but yeah, we know there's a lot of Centennial Cottages and homes around the lake, so uh, a lot of people love the area in spite of the pollution problems. and. To me, it's worth it. If my life was shortened a little bit because um, I'd still want to live here. I, I can't, can't imagine any place else I'd rather live. So. Do you think it hurt our image? I do for a while, but I think our image is, um, I think it's coming back. And there's been a lot of things done to improve. Um, well, actually, tearing down the chemical companies was certainly, if you don't see it, you're, the people that are coming to the area for the first time, they're not, they're not going to relate. They're not going to relate to the problems we had. And, and, and they have been remediated. So, I mean, a lot of money and effort has been put into restoring to the best of our ability what, what we had. So. What did you think of the companies that were eventually found responsible for the pollution? Well, I say shame on them, because I think in a lot of cases they, you know, scientifically they knew more than the average person living around here. We, we have, we don't have perfect knowledge. We have more better knowledge now because of all the problems we had. We've been educated, but uh, I say shame on them. I mean, this the sandy soil doesn't, it's not clay, and it, it holds nothing. The pollution traveled from their no man's land all the way to White Lake very, fairly easily in a relatively short time. And same with DuPont. I know, I think their problem was more of an alkaline problem and they're still pulling the lime piles out of there. So Muskegon Chemical, I know they dumped into, ended up in a little creek that ended up in the mill pond. So yeah, I say shame on all of them because between the D, DNR and all the groups that were supposed to monitor them, as well as the companies themselves. I think we were just really uh, shortchanged. Yeah. Well, 
Did you have a viewpoint of community leaders during this time? I mean, did you expect that they might uh, do something? Again, I think they, once the pollution was, you know, it was determined, I, I think they did as much as they could to uh, facilitate, complain when, again, I think the city was involved, the uh, community was involved when we didn't want the waste from another part of the state coming back here. So I think they did what they could. But I was younger and had a lot of other things on my mind. and. Of course, I protested the landfill. I, I thought that was absolutely ridiculous of all the places to put landfills to perch it very close to, to uh, a celery farm and our river. I thought of all places. I thought, you know, sometimes I think we don't learn from the past. So, as a whole, I think we are. I think we're doing better now, but uh, you, I think we have to be vigilant. I mean, you can't ever just be blase and and just say somebody else is going to do it I, I i think more now than ever I, I i think we have to stand up it's like protecting our dunes that was a recent victory out at the at lake michigan i think you you have to show up in numbers you just can't have one or two eloquent speakers i think you need numbers to to convey a, a community's outrage when you think something's really wrong so yeah, I think in the if I had to do it over again, I would have I would have been there with Mary Mahoney to greet the trucks and shake my fists. <laughs> so God bless Mary. <laughs> Did, has your viewpoint of of government changed since the seventies um, and eighties, like the DNR and the federal environmental agencies? Oh, I think I think they do some things right. I think they're still. I don't know, sometimes it seems like some decisions are more political than environmental. So I, th I think we just have to be vigilant. And I think we do have good uh, uh, representation now. It seems like in some of our recent fights, our, our representatives have been right there with us. So I'm, I find that very heartening. Uh, what do you think about um, progress made to clean up White Lake? Are you familiar with any of the efforts? Well, uh, again, I'm pretty close to the Hooker site, so I, I thought it was good when they, uh, they did some dredging. I don't know how many years ago, quite a few years ago. And I think they also did some dredging, in, quite a bit of dredging um, near the um, tannery site. Um, those are the two that I'm most familiar with. I know they're trying to keep things from coming down the river. They're addressing some of the nutrients that come down the river, so that's a good thing. So, what changes do you see for the White Lake future in the future? Well, our lots on the north side of the lake are so big, and houses are set back quite a bit further from the lake shore. I'm still concerned about the the south shore of of White Lake. I'd like to. I know it would probably encourage more development, so there's people that are against it for that reason. I'd like to see a sewer line on the south side of the lake. I think that's a big concern. Um, seeping septic tanks and nutrients getting in, into the lake that way. So. What do you envision as our greatest need um, in relation to environmental protection? Our greatest need. Boy, we've made so much progress so, so far, but uh, I think just vigilance. It just seems like there's always people that are are willing to take shortcuts. So um, I think people just have to be vigilant and watch out for their neighbors. You know, keep everybody honest. But uh, I, I I just think we've we've come a long way. So I'm kind of uh, happy with that. But as far as the future, I'm not, I'm not really sure. Again, if we're going to grow, I think we have to have the infrastructure to handle that. And again, that might be a sewer line or, or water lines or whatever. Um, I think we have to be a little concerned about what we pave and where our storm sewers go. I'm always concerned when oily water has a direct route into the lake. So 
I don't know if that's a huge problem now, but uh, it, it's a problem. What lessons do you think we've learned, um, or people in the community may have learned about what happened and um, what's been done to help White Lake recover? Well, like I said, we're kind of the poster child of uh, what not to let happen. So I, I think it's just having a history. Uh, is, you know, if, if a company like these chemical companies came to a, a depressed area and offered them jobs and whatever, right? if anybody came back to this area wanting to do something similar, I think we just have to, you know, uh, uh, just the knowledge that we have would would benefit us. It wouldn't. We wouldn't take the same route. We wouldn't just welcome them with open arms without a lot of assurances and uh, you know making making sure the government was doing its part to keep us safe, and not just burying their waste in the backyard. So. Do you have anything to add that I haven't asked? Not really. Just uh, it's, it's been. I know we've faced some other challenges together, and I'm just really happy to know you. And there's just it's a wonderful place to live, and we've got wonderful people who live here and care about this area. And I hope that continues. I hope that the people that come to this area don't uh, buy nine acres and just cut down all the trees. <laughs> and I hope I wasn't really pleased with uh, the high density proposal. Um, down the road at Ravenswood, but I thought I went to a meeting and I put in my two cents and I just said I'm glad I don't have to live next to it and it really hasn't uh, Really hasn't taken off maybe because of the economy, but I just can't imagine unless somebody's coming from a big city when you have an option of enjoying nature to just you know live in a very close cramped area I don't know I guess different things appeal to different people, but uh, we make those choices and I hope as a community we I know we've put some things on the books about uh, prohibiting keyholes I hope we the townships and the cities honor those restrictions and don't just uh, say oh in this case we can make a few more tax dollars so let's uh, make an exception this time and the next time and the next time so I, uh, I hope that we kind of hold our guns and we have a, we have a lot of beautiful access to our lakes and you know a, a keyhole is giving some individuals kind of their private access but uh, there's a lot of land on the lake and if you want a piece of land buy it without it being part of a keyhole I think the whole area benefits from that so but I think that's about it. So, well, thank you very much, John. Yeah, and uh, thank you for joining me in my little piece of heaven here. And I have to come back, <laughs> have a lemonade with me sometime. I'll do that. All right, thank you.